I've had to set my timer. This is a third video in a series of how to make engineering computations associated with atmospheric air. And in this video, I want to show you how to make uh, calculations associated with whole house heating with a forced air HVAC system. So this is a little schematic um, of uh, what we do in the wintertime to heat our homes with a forced air um, HVAC, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. What we'll cover is a residential air handler crash course. So uh, not the stuff about psychrometrics, but essentially how does a residential HVAC air handler work? Uh, and then one example on how do you heat your home in the wintertime with this. So here's the crash course. This is an overall schematic view of how a whole house HVAC system works in the winter and the summer. So it's one piece of equipment. So let's see what we have. Well, let's start with what we call return air that's coming from your rooms, okay? So uh, air that needs to be uh, either heated in the winter or cooled in the summer. So this fan then is gonna blow air upwards. And in a winter time, this is gonna be our example, uh, we've got a, a furnace section, typically uh, that might be, we might have natural gas and air coming in uh, to a heating section um, or uh, could be uh, electric resistance heating, uh, could be fuel oil um, and air uh, combustion uh, heating in a furnace section. Uh, now that uh, the combustion products do not mix with the air, with the return air, totally separate uh, heating system. But that's in the wintertime, that's how that air is heated. Now, in the summertime, we don't use the furnace. We use the evaporator section from a traditional vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So these will be cold coils that will cool the air. And that's going to give us comfortable supply air. Whether winter or summer, we've got comfortable supply air going back to the room. Now in the summer, so you see that I'm showing blue as rejecting heat in the evaporator in the summer, or this red block arrow adding heat to the air in the winter. So notice here this little blue arrow going down to the drain. Well, in the summertime, uh, this evaporator is so cold that it will um, cool the flow down below the dew point. And in the the final video, we'll talk about how when you're below the dew point, you get condensate, cool condensate that's dripping to the drain. But let's focus on heating right now. All right, well, this is an actual picture of our HVAC air handler in the basement of our home here in Daleville. So let's see what we have. We've got return air coming from, so you can see it coming down from the first floor floor, okay? A duct coming in, that's the return air, and it's going vertically down into the uh, blower section where the air is, is pulled. The return air is blown then up through the air handler. Okay, so the next, so it takes a, a 180 degree turn. And so in the winter, here's our furnace section where heat would be added in the winter. This would be our evaporator section, which we would use in the summer. Um, this little PV, white PVC line that you see is sort of horizontal, but going down to our floor drain, that's where in the summertime, cold condensate uh, would drip to, okay? And then finally, so back to winter operation, um, uh, which we have right now in November, uh, nice warm air is being blown back up to the distribution system to the whole house um, for nice warm air going to all our rooms. That's called supply air. Okay, so there's your crash course. Let's look quickly at the winter heating situation for the vapor. So we're gonna look at a TS diagram. Here's our vapor dome. Remember the partial pressure of the vapor in the air mixture is gonna be a low number. It's gonna be a low partial pressure. That's why I'm showing it so far low on the vapor dome. And so we would start here. This would be our return air partial pressure. We're heating that we're heating that um, air vapor mixture at constant partial pressure. And so we're heat, look how we're, return air temperature, sort of a low temperature, cold. 
nice warm supply air going back to the room, warmer, okay? So there, that's how I get my two points here, return air and supply air. So we've got a constant partial pressure heating process, and that's all. that would also be a constant humidity ratio process. <coughs> Pardon me. So here's our worked out example problem. A lot of words. I'll read them to you. Field measurements are conducted on a residential home, whole home forced air heating system. Uh, the return air duct has certain measurements, 61 by 61 meters, square uh, centimeters. <clears throat> and I've measured the average inlet airflow velocity as 122 meters per minute, temperature coming back to the air handler, 20 degrees C, and a relative humidity of 30 degree, 30 percent. Atmospheric pressure here in Daleville, about 100 kPa. The inlet air is heated in the air handler and it's supplied back to the rooms at a nice, comfy, warm 35 degrees C. Okay. All right. So here's our assignment. We've got one, two, three, four, five things to find. The volumetric flow rate entering the air handler should be easy. The dry air mass flow rate entering the air handler. That's M dot of the dry air. The water vapor mass flow rate entering the air handler. That would be M dot of the vapor. Determine the relative humidity of the air going back to the rooms, the supply air. The return air is given, but we want to calculate the relative humidity going back to the rooms. Finally, determine the rate at which we're adding heat to the return air. Okay. So that's our assignment. That's going to be our worked out problem. So you may say, well, how did you get those numbers? Well, gosh, here's the real photograph of the way I got those numbers. I set up a vane anemometer. Okay, you see, I, you've probably seen one of these before. Spins around. The, the vanes spin around uh, based on the velocity of the air passing through it. I set it up at, the inlet, at our um, return air inlet uh, duct. Okay, measured the inlet duct and... There it is, okay, 122 meters per minute with this vein anemometer. All right, so let's start with a sketch. So I'll just use the photograph as a sketch. Here is state one, the return air from the rooms. Coming in, making a 180 degree turn. Here's where we're adding heat for our winter operation, going up to state two at 35 degrees C. State one, coming back, 20 degrees C, coming back, and at a relative humidity, 30%, and a system pressure of 100 kPa. So there's our sketch. Let's start working on the numerics of the problem. Return air volumetric flow. I hope that you've got this nailed. The volumetric flow is simply the cross-sectional area of the duct times the average velocity in the duct, or 45.4 cubic meters per minute, velocity times area. Next thing we're going to do is uh, we are going to determine the partial pressure of the vapor um, and the partial pressure of the dry air. Because what we need to remember our assignment is what's the mass flow rate of the vapor and what's the mass flow rate of the dry air. So we need to get the specific volume of the dry air since we have the volumetric flow rate. So here we go. We'll go to the temperature table of the steam tables. Go to 20 degrees C and write down the PG, P sub G, is 2.339 kPa. Don't forget the bars conversion. Okay. Well, let's see. What is our definition of relative humidity? Um, we can get P sub V, the partial pressure of the vapor, by taking the relative humidity times PG. 2.339 times 0.3 is... PV1 is 0 0.7017 kPa. Now, we know that the system pressure is 100, so the dry air partial pressure, partial pressure of the dry air is a little less than 100, 99.3 kPa. So we've done that. So we're looking ahead. We're going to need the partial pressure of the dry air to compute the specific volume of the dry air. Okay, and so uh, let's see, here's what I did. Um, 
I wrote down the humidity ratio. Since I had PV, I just calculated the humidity ratio, a little tiny number, 0 0.004395 kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air. So that's just sort of a intermediate step. The next thing that I did was I said, what's the specific volume of the dry air? Well, I remember the ideal gas equation of state, P times little v equals RT. Therefore, V, little v, is equal to RT over P. So V1 of the dry air is, so remembering we've got to convert our temperature to uh, degrees K, okay? Uh, pressure in KPA, R for air, 0.287. I hope you know that off the top of your head now, 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram degree K. If not, R bar over the molecular weight, Okay, so V1 of the dry air is 0.8469 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. So that's the units, cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. I just, I have the total volumetric flow rate, so I can multiply the volumetric flow rate by little v of the dry air to give me M dot, I'm sorry, I said multiply, volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume to get the units right. Volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. M dot of dry air is 53.61 kilograms per minute flowing through our air handler. M dot dry air, there it is. So then I did all that pre-work to get the humidity ratio up here. That makes the next step very easy. I simply multiply M dot of the dry air by omega, the humidity ratio to get M dot of the vapor is a small number, 0.2356 kilograms per minute. So we're well over halfway there in our problem solving. We've got M dot of the dry air and M dot of the vapor coming in. Now, recognize for this heating situation, think about the continuity equation. Think about the inflows in the one inlet, one outlet. So M dot of the dry air is constant through the whole process. That equals the outlet as does the M dot of the vapor. The inlet vapor flow equals the outlet vapor flow. All right, so the next thing was, what's the relative humidity of the state two air? What's being resupplied back to the rooms, okay? Now, I went through this elegant process of recalculating PV2, okay? Using omega and, and these formulas and stuff, and I got, uh, PV2 is 0 0.7017. And it smacked, it smacked me in the face when I was reviewing my work. Wait a minute. It's easier to observe from the TS diagram that PV2 equals PV1 because of continuity equation. And so I wasted some time. I, I should have just said PV2 equals PV1 for this situation of heating. All right. Now, I go to uh, look PG2 up at my supply air temperature. I don't have a screenshot of that just yet, but I've got PG2 at that higher temperature. Was that 35 degrees C? I think so. 5.628 kPa. So look, if I've got PG and PV, calculate the relative humidity, PV over PG, 0.125. 12.5% relative humidity supplied to our rooms. Now, okay, so no, there's a big practical conclusion other than just getting the numbers. That is that this winter heating process, the relative humidity really, really decreases. And how many times have you heard people say, yeah, heating in the wintertime, heating air in the wintertime, it's a dry heat, it's a dry heat. And they shake their heads because really the, the air coming back into your rooms, it really is dry. So we, we uh, came back from the rooms at 30% uh, and we're supplying air of the room at 12 and percent. Very interesting. So our engineering calculations perfectly align with what we observe in the world. Our last assignment is to determine the rate at which we're adding heat to the flow. That's very critical for engineering calculations, right? So for this heating situation, recognize 
m dot of the dry air at state one exactly equals m dot of the dry air at state two. So we'll call it m dot of dry air. m dot of the vapor at state one equals m dot of the vapor at state two. Okay. Omega one equals omega two. For the heating situation, do you see that for this heating process one to two, there's no power associated with that process. We're only heating. So W dot out for the first law is zero. W dot out is zero. So now let's write down the first law for steady state, steady flow. First law, one inlet, one outlet. We've got a mixture of dry air and water vapor. So let's write down the first law. Q dot in, that's what we're looking for. Minus W dot out, that's zero. Equals M dot of the dry air times the change in the dry air enthalpy from two to one plus m dot of the vapor times the change in enthalpy of the vapor from one to two. I think I said that wrong here, dry air. So do you see how that works? So what we're doing is we're, we're recognizing two constituents of the mixture, dry air and vapor. Now we've got to simplify. All right, so let's, what can we do to simplify? We can observe, okay, uh, let's look at the dry air first. H2 minus H1 of dry air. Hmm. The temperature is not changing much. We will treat air as an ideal gas with constant specific heat. So H2 minus H1 of the dry air is simply going to be Cp for air times delta T, T2 minus T1. So there is an important big step over here on the vapor, M dot of the vapor. Wow, I could just um, put in a number there, but do you see that I can recognize that M dot of the vapor can be given by M dot of the dry air times omega. That's gonna be very powerful in your problem solving for tougher problems, okay? You see, I've, so m dot of the vapor equals m dot of the dry air times omega times the quantity H2 minus H1 of the vapor. All right. Now we've got to study what do we have and what do we need? Q dot n, that's what we're looking for. M dot of the dry air, we have a number for that. Cp, uh, you need that, but we're going to look that up in our tables in the back of the book. T2 and T1, do we have that? Yeah, that's given in the problem. Omega, we calculated that from before. H2 of the vapor and H1 of the vapor, we need those, and we will look those up in the temperature table at T2, 35 degrees C, and T1, gosh, I forgot, 20 degrees C, I believe is what that was. So we need these three things, and let's see how to get those. C sub P, we'll go to table A20, we'll look up air, and for a nominal temperature of 300, let's use what common practice is to use 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram degree K for these atmospheric air situations, 1.005. We go to state one, the enthalpy of the vapor. So we're gonna go down to 20 degrees C. We look over at saturated vapor, H sub G at T2. 2538.1, state two, 35 degrees C. The enthalpy of the vapor at state two is gonna be H sub G at T2, 2565.3. So now we've got enough to crank the numbers. So here we go. Uh, we've got M dot of dry air from before, okay? Uh, in kilograms per minute, now remember, we're looking for kilowatts. And so we need to transform kilograms per minute into kilograms per second, dividing by 60. Um, omega, 0 0.004395, we already got it. Cp of air, T2. Um, I convert converted it to degrees K to, T, simply to stay in absolute temperature, both in T2 and T1. Okay. H1 of the vapor we wrote down, H2 of the vapor, H2 with a vapor we wrote down from our steam tables. So now it's plug and chug into that first law. And here's the first law. Q dot N is 13.58 kilowatts. 
Okay, we've been going for 20 minutes now, but we have fully answered the analysis using the steam tables. Volumetric flow, 45.4 cubic meters per minute. Dry air mass flow rate, 53.6 kilograms per minute. Water vapor mass flow rate, 0.236. Look how much bigger the airflow is than the vapor. That's perfectly reasonable. That's what you want to be looking for. The relative humidity supplied back to the rooms, dry, 12.5%. The rate at which heat was added using the first law, 13.58 kilowatts. So there's our analysis. Now, let's repeat that exact problem, except let's use the psychrometric chart to solve the problem. I won't reread the problem. This is a screenshot of example problem one, except use the psychrometric chart. It's going to be a very similar approach, but it's going to go much faster. Let's go find the psychrometric chart in the back of the book. And here it is. Let's plan our work. What will we do? We've got two states to worry about, state one and state two. We will locate those on our psychrometric chart, and we will put some black dots at both of those two places, state one, return air, and two, supply air going back to the room. The next thing we'll do is to get the dry air mass flow rate, we will get the specific volume. That's okay at state one, because that's where we know the velocity in the area. Okay. The next thing we'll do is get the relative humidity um, at state two, the supply air relative humidity. Okay. Then um, let's see, I need to move my zoom menu. We will determine the humidity ratio so that we can get the mass flow of the vapor. And then for the first law, this is gonna, we're gonna just de determine the moist air enthalpy. So let's familiarize ourselves with what we have on this psychrometric chart before we start moving ahead. Let's, let's look and read what we have. The x-axis, dry bulb temperature, that's gonna be the temperature of the mixture we measure with this thermometer, dry bulb, okay? The y-axis, humidity ratio, omega, okay? So that's gonna help us. Now let's look at some other things we have here. One is the, in these sort of diagonal lines, it says specific volume in cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. That's extremely valuable. Cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. Another, set of parameters is the relative humidity of the mixture going from 10 up to 100, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up to 100. Relative humidity is on there. Okay, and then finally, another high value item is the enthalpy. Let's look way over here to the left. Specific enthalpy, that's little h, of the moist air. And so the cool thing about this is that it's the enthalpy of the combined dry air and vapor in units of kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. It's the enthalpy of the moist air with units kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. We're going to be able to get this knocked right out with a good understanding of what we have. So we've planned our work. Okay, first step, let's locate our states one and two. State one. We're going to wet bulb temperature of 20 and a relative humidity of 30%. So we look where these lines intersect, and there it is. Put a big black dot there, return air one. We're heating our air. Did I, I hope I convinced you that we're heating our air at constant humidity ratio since the dry air flow rate is constant and the vapor flow rate is constant. So we are moving on a horizontal line, horizontal line, constant humidity ratio up to the, the temperature, uh, 35 degrees. So the intersect, so we're gonna go across horizontally until we intersect 35, put a big black dot there. There's our process and our two states. Next step. Let's determine the specific volume at state one. So let's only look now, let's focus on state one and let's see specific volume. Here it is, specific volume values. And here's a specific volume way down here at point eight. Here's a specific volume 0.85. 
specific volume 0.9. And so you have to study these various, the changes, the grid lines, and you see that we're in between 0.8 and 0.85, okay? And so we're gonna have to read off our um, specific volume, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.81, 0 0.82, 0.83, not quite 0.84. So it's going to be between 0.83 and 0.84. And I've written that down on the next slide. I can't remember exactly what I wrote down. Okay. Let's determine the relative humidity at state one. Let's focus on state two. Relative humidity at state two. Okay, let's look at these numbers. Relative humidity is going from uh, 10 up to 90%. Here's our dot. So I see with my eyes, our relative humidity is above 10, but below 20. So I've got to really, I've got to use some calibrated eyeballs to eyeball numerically, what is the relative humidity there? And so it's not quite 15, but the big reveal will be the next slide where I log the numbers that I use with, my, with our calibrated eye. Still not ready for the big reveal yet. Enthalpies. We're going to need enthalpies at states one and two. Here is our axis specific enthalpy. And notice how all these lines are sort of diagonal lines. You got to get your head sort of tilted around to see that, okay, at the, what's the enthalpy at this point? I'm going to draw a pa line parallel to these grid lines. So it looks to me like I've got two, four, about 31. I'd say that looks like about 31 kilo, moist air enthalpy kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. At state two, same parallel line coming up here. Not quite 50, uh, 42, 4, 6. Uh, looks like a little over 47, a little over 47 to me. Okay. I think the next slide is the big reveal. All right, so let's see what I, what, what did I log for all those numbers with my calibrated eye? Uh, the enthalpies, H1, I've got 32, H2, I've got 47. That's where I logged it, okay. The specific volume, I logged that as 0.88 cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. The relative humidity I, with, those, with the calibrated eye, I got 13%. That's the best I could do. 13% and omega, omega 0. 0.0045. That was the best I could do. All right. And so anyway, here, and then also that was all my psychrometric studying. Um, in this part of the solution, I've got my volumetric flow rate, uh, velocity times area, 45.4. Okay. What's our next steps? And look, we've got some answers here already. M dot of the dry air then uh, is going to be uh, the volumetric flow rate at state one divided by the specific volume that we read off of our psychrometric chart. So boom, just like that, 51.59 kilograms per minute M dot dry air. Boom, just like that now. Omega two, we read off the chart. If I've got M dot of dry air, I apply humidity ratio, kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air to get M dot of the vapor, 0. 0.2321. Look how fast this is going now. So we've got two more answers. The first law, wow, this is really easy, much easier than the steam table approach. Q dot N minus W dot out, which is zero, equals M, is M dot of the dry air to get our units right times H2 of the moist mixture minus H1 of the moist mixture. So the psychrometric chart gives you this mixture enthalpy based on dry kilograms of air. So this is going to get our unit straight. So we've got Q dot N is M dot of the dry air. We just got times H2 minus H1 of the moist mixture or 12.9 kilowatts. So boom, just like that, you've got some answers and quickly. And you need to practice using that psychrometric chart before you go into your test. Otherwise, you're sunk. Get a little practice reading the psychrometric chart. Redo this problem. Satisfy yourself. You can do it on your own. All right, well, let's summarize what we did with the psychrometric chart. 
Um, we've got the 45.4 cubic meters per minute. That's the exact same as the uh, steam tables approach, exact same. Dry air mass flow, 51.59 kilograms a minute. Water mass flow, 0.232 kilograms per minute. Relative humidity supplied back to the rooms, 13%. And rate at which heat is added, 12.9 kilowatts. All right, so great. We've got numerical results. Let's compare the two methods that are identical. We just get slightly different numbers. And so this is to show you, look, either method is going to be okay. You're going to get different numerical answers. Do not expect exact duplication. But for engineering purposes and designing heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, this, these are very consistent results. Uh, 53.6 compared to 51 dry air mass flow rate, nearly identical vapor mass flow rates. Wow, even with the how tough it was to read the psychrometric chart, look at our relative humidity supplied back to the rooms. Almost a, within a half a percent, and the rate at which is, heat is added, um, good agreement, about 13 kilowatt psychrometric chart compared to 13 and a half using the property tables. And that's going to enable you to size your heating element or your furnace size. So uh, you're well on your way to analyzing HVAC systems if you've got a pretty good handle on this. Okay, what are the takeaways from this uh, video? Um, it's under, important that you understand how the whole house heating and cooling systems work. Common mechanical engineering skill to have. Uh, in the winter heating mode, recognize it is a constant humidity ratio process. It decreases, the heating process decreases the relative humidity. It's a dry heat in the winter. And the psychrometric chart does give you three significant figures at most, but it does give you good, adequate results. So that's it. We took 32 minutes, uh, and uh, I hope this has helped you with your understanding of kind of the, some basics of an HVAC heating system, at least. Uh, and also, I hope it's improved your ability to uh, use the psychrometric chart as a tool to help you solve some engineering problems. Uh, Hope you see, tune in for the fourth and final uh, set uh, of videos for this uh, psychrometric chart and atmospheric air calculations. Hope to see you then.